It is with great joy and that we come into your presence this morning, our Father. On this blessed Sabbath day, we have entered into your, you've allowed us to enter into this holy place on this your holy day to worship you. We need to be drawn close to you today more than ever before. We want our lives changed. We want our minds stimulated. We want to be inspired by your Holy Spirit so that when we leave here today, we will leave better than when we came in is our prayer in Jesus name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Luke 18 and verse 1 says that men ought to pray and not, not faint. I want you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Daniel. Daniel 1. It is a, the book of Daniel for Seventh-day Adventists is a very familiar book. It is the story of Daniel. The first few chapters are a story of Daniel and his companions taken into Babylonian captivity. Daniel talks about Daniel's faithfulness in, in, in the face of threatening danger. Daniel 1.8 talks about Daniel's resolve, how he purposed in his heart that he would not compromise his faith. His faith and his conviction were strong. His prayer life was strong as evidenced by his strong resolve and his boldness to be put to a test that only the Lord could see he and his companions through. Refusing to eat from the king's table and say, please uh, uh, serve us a vegetarian diet. We want to stay true to our God. And we saw how God in Jan Daniel 1 honored the faith of his people. And he, when he was examined by King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar found that he and his companions were 10 times more wiser than all the wise men in the king's court. Daniel and his friends prayed and they fainted not. In chapter 2 of Daniel, finds a scene where Nebuchadnezzar the king is having many dreams, recurrent dreams, and it shakes the king to the point of, of arousal, and he calls all of his wise men to him, and he says, I've got a problem. I've had a dream that I don't know what it means. And they said, no problem, king. You tell us the dream, and we'll give you the interpretation. He said, no, no. Not that easy. See, I can't remember what I dreamed. So you've got to tell me what I dreamed, and you've got to give me the interpretation thereof. And they said, King, there's nobody on this earth that can do that. He says, fine. You can't do it? Then I'll just kill all of you. And the word got to Daniel. Now, it's interesting that in the first chapter of Daniel, the king discovered that they were 10 times more wiser than the wise men, and yet when the king called the wise men, Daniel and his companions were not called. And when the word got to Daniel that a death decree had been, had been issued, Daniel then requested an audience with the king to appeal for more time, time to spend with God in prayer. God grants the prayer request of Daniel and his friends and he gives the interpretation to the king's dream. Now this is a story that we are familiar with. We know the interpretation of the dream, how King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of a great image, the head of gold that represented Babylon and it had breast and arms of what everybody? Silver. It had belly and thighs of representing the Grecian Empire. It had legs of representing Rome and feet of iron and clay that represented the dividing kingdoms. And then there was a stone cut away without hands that destroys the image and that represents the kingdom of God. Did you listen to yourself? You know this. It's an assurance that no matter what occurs in this world, 
As far as earthly rulers are concerned, there is a God in heaven who rules over all. Say amen. amen. God sets up kings and he puts them down. And our confidence is not in men, but it's in God. We know this prophecy and its importance. God's got the whole world in his hands and he will not and has not surrendered his control to Satan or those working as his agents. But the Word of God is a powerful book. And if you think that, have you gotten the interpretation of Daniel 2 and all of those things that have gone with it, you think, well, I've got that chapter. Well, maybe you didn't. Because I've discovered that as you go through that, that there's, a, there's an important part that we often kind of skim through that we need to focus in on, the, on today. Just when you think you have it, there's always more to learn and contemplate from God's Word. There are deeper lessons to be learned and lessons that further prepare us for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The experience of Daniel and the others taken into Babylonian capt captivity literally is our experience. Those living in the days prior to the coming of Christ, second coming of Christ. Like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We are captives in a foreign land. This present world is not our home. We are exposed to and have been forced to live in a land ruled by a tyrant. We have been exposed and have experienced education, lofty as it might be, but an education that is purpose to get us used to living and staying here on this earth. Oh, wait, may we live, we may live and die here. But this is not our home. What do you say? We, we live among those who don't eat like God has prescribed. We live among those who eat regularly from the portion of the ruler's table. But we like Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego must remain faithful to God and, and even in the face of death. Question is, have you, have I, obtained in our living a faith like that. See, when the word got to Daniel that they were going, that a death decree had been issued, the Bible tells us that Daniel, and I want you to turn to Daniel 2, tells us that Daniel and his companions in verse 17 He returned to his house and he explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from God, from the God of heaven, concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel and his companions began to pray. They presented their petitions to God in faith, believing that God hears and answers prayer. Do we still believe that? In verse 19 of chapter 2, the Bible says during the night, what time of the day? The mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. Daniel and his companions prayed, and then they went to sleep, resting in the Lord. They prayed and went to sleep before they received an answer to their prayer. When you pray, can you rest? Can you really take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there? Understanding the power of prayer and allowing God to give you the level of faith that will move you forward is the level of faith that God desires that we have in these days and times. A faith that will not be moved even in the face of death. It's our faith in a prayer answering God that prepares us for the coming of the Lord as in Daniel 2, what do you say? But here's the thing that happens when we pray. 
We pray, but sometimes in the back of our minds, if we are strictly honest with ourselves, we'll lay something on, on, at the feet of God, but in our back of our minds, we've always got a plan B, just in case God doesn't come through. Amen, anyhow. You see, the image of Daniel 2 is important. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's vital for our understanding of the world. The dates uh, of when the ancient rulers ruled is important, but not essential. We know the facts of Daniel because history and present reality affirms what God told an ancient king through a dream and the interpretation given by God's servant, and they are true. We know all of that, but we have come to the point in our lives that we can that we can live in an arena of faith in the Lord or have we come to a, a point in our lives that we can live in an arena of faith that will see us through any and every trial of, that life presents. This is the crux of my message today. Daniel and his friends prayed and they went to sleep before the answer to their prayer came. Let's understand the power of prayer and really answered the question, what is prayer? Luke 11 in verse one, the disciples had come to Jesus and they, they said, Lord, teach us to pray, just like John taught his disciples how to pray. And the Lord's prayer, as it's called, was given twice by Christ. First to the multitude on the sermon of, in the Sermon on the, on the Mount, and again, some months later, to the disciples alone. The disciples had been for a short time absent from Christ and when on their return they found him absorbed in his communion with his father, he seemed unconscious of their presence as he continued to pray aloud. Uh, they, they noticed the celestial brightness of his face. He seemed in the very presence of the unseen and there was a living power in his words as one who spoke with God. The hearts of the disciples were deeply moved. They had observed Jesus throughout the challenges and the difficulties that, that he had with the religious leaders and his incessant labor with, with the multitudes. They saw how utterly wearied he had become that even his mother and his brothers and even the disciples feared for his life. But when he returned from those times of communion in prayer with his father, they marked the look of peace upon his face, the sense of refreshment that seemed to pervade his presence. It was from hours spent with God that he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. The disciples came to connect his hours of prayer with the power of his words and his works. And as they listened to his supplication, their hearts were awed and humbled. And when he had finished his prayer, it was with deep conviction of their own deep need that they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to pray. Just like what we have just witnessed, teach us to pray. Story is told of the famed evangelist D.L. Moody. And he was addressing a crowd, a crowded meeting of children in Edinburgh, Scotland. In order to get their attention, he began with this question. He says, what is prayer? And to his surprise, a young boy stood up and with a clear, succinct, response said prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to his will in the acknowledgement of his mercies <laughs> little boy and if all of us thought for a moment what answer would you give if you were asked the question what is prayer what do we mean by prayer. I believe that most would give the answer, prayer is asking things from God. But surely prayer is much more than merely getting God to run errands for us. What do you say? Amen. The word prayer really means a wish directed toward, toward God. But all that true prayer seeks 
is God himself for with him we get all that we need we do not know that there is nothing we do know that there is nothing that the devil dreads so much as when God's people begin to pray his great concern then is to keep us from praying he loves to see us up to our eyes in work provided that we do not pray he does not fear because we are eager and earnest Bible students provided we are little in prayer someone wisely said that Satan laughs at our toilings mocks at our wisdom but trembles when we pray all this is so familiar to each of us but do we really pray and if not then failure must dog our footsteps whatever signs of apparent success there may be the greatest thing that we can do for God or for man is to pray for we can accomplish far more by our prayers than by our works prayer is omnipotent prayer is what everybody it can do anything that God can do when we pray God works we all know how to pray and here I may be speaking presumptuously but perhaps many of us need to cry as the disciples did to the Lord Lord teach us to pray we all know this so the question is why don't we pray more why is it such a struggle to utilize the greatest spiritual weapon at our disposal let's talk about our modern struggle with with this powerful weapon prayer ranks so high on surveys of theoretical importance and so low on surveys of actual satisfaction we have read of Luther and other highly spiritual men and others that you may know and have known that are spiritual giants because of their time that they spend with the Lord in prayer but there's a great disparity between them and modern day prayers who fidget if someone or even ourselves pray for more than 10 minutes in theory prayer is the essential human act a priceless point of contact with the God of the universe but in practice prayer is often confusing and fraught with frustrations there's some reasons for that the advances in science and technology contribute to our confusion about prayer modern skepticism taints prayer we breathe in an atmosphere of doubt uh, to some people prayer seems as George Buttrick put it spasms of words lost in a cosmic indifference see prayer almost becomes for the Christian becomes a cliche term someone comes to you and they tell you and say to you and you say to them I'll pray for you and they walk away and we forget to pray for them I got into the habit that if someone if I tell someone I'm gonna pray for them I pray for them right then come on say amen, amen. Huh? prosperity becomes an area of obstruction for prayer when things are going good for us we tend to pray less and sometimes not at all but when things get a little tight when the challenges of the world come upon us then we find ourselves in much prayer uh, Christianity and prayer life and our prayer life is sometimes like that song sometimes up sometimes down sometimes almost level with the ground I want to pray and, and in my prayer life I want it to be and reach a plateau with God's help and keep it there what do you say Amen. there are time pressures that crowd out the leisurely space that prayer seems to require communication with people has gotten shorter and shorter and more cryptic we have text messages and emails and all of those types of things that that that, that we use that that technology has opened to us we have less and less time for communication let alone contemplation 
We have the constant sensation of not enough. Not enough time, not enough rest, not enough exercise, not enough leisure. And the question is, where does God fit in to that scheme? You see, there are two important elements to good, any good relationships. Time and communication. In order to have good horizontal uh, or relationships on the horizontal plane, you've got to invest your time and you've got to learn how to talk to one another. But the same is with God. If we want a good relationship with God, we've got to spend time with him in prayer. Come on, say amen. amen. We've got to spend and communicate. We've got to spend time with him in prayer and in Bible study. And we've got to communicate with him through prayer. Prayer is us talking to God. Studying his word is God talking back to us. And if you want a good horizontal relationships to form, you've got to first develop that vertical relationship with God. Giving him time and communication. Prayer is the most important use of time for the believing Christian. Changing our focus changes our prayer life. Psalms 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that what? I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Two commands of equal importance stand out in the first part of Psalms 46 and verse 10. The first, I must be still. Something that modern life conspires against. Regular mail, now called snail mail, is too slow. Emails and text messages is now the norm. And there's an emphasis on being on being rather than doing. Even a few moments of quiet do not come naturally in this hectic, buzzing world that we live in. If I stay silent for 15 seconds, you'd think, What's, gonna, what's he about ready to say? Has he forgotten what he's going to say? <laughs> There's one writer by the name of Patricia Hampel. And she went on a walking pilgrimage uh, to, a, to a CC in Italy. And she began to make a list in answer to the question, what is prayer? And she began by writing down a, free, a few words. She wrote down the word praise. Prayer is praise. Prayer is gratitude. Prayer is begging, pleading, cutting deals, or bargaining. She wrote down fruitless whining. She wrote down the word focus. And then she broke off the list. For she discovered that prayer only seems like an act of language. Fundamentally, it is a position, a placement of oneself. She went on to discover that prayer as focus is not a way of limiting what can be seen. It is a habit of attention brought to bear on all that is. A habit of attention. Be still. In that focus, all else will come into focus. Somebody say amen. amen. In that rift of my routine, the universe falls into alignment. Being still prepares us for the second command. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the, among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Only through prayer can I believe that truth in the midst of a world that colludes to suppress, not to exalt God. Be still and know that I am God. The Latin imperative for be still is the word vacate. As one writer said, Simon Tugwell explains, God invites us when we pray, God invites us to take a holiday or a vacation 
to stop being God for a while and let him be God. Too often we see prayer as a chore, something that must be scheduled around other appointments, shoehorned in among other pressing activities. And we missed the point, says Tugwell. God is inviting us to take a break when we pray, to play truant. We can stop doing all those important things we have to do in our capacity as God and leave it to him to be God. That's what I meant earlier that sometimes that when we pray, it's hard even because our, our sensibilities have been, have been twisted to a point where it's hard for us to really truly trust God with every area and aspect of our lives. And so we, and, and it's revealed in our, in our language. I can solve my problems. I can do this. I can do that. But when we change our focus and stop trying to be God and let God be God, then our problems never stop being problems and they become challenges because we've allowed God to do all things for us. If we certainly believe that, say amen out there. Amen. We often state it, I can do how many things? Oh. Through who? Prayer allows me to admit my failures, my weaknesses, and my limitations to the one who responds to human vulnerability with infinite mercy. To let God be God means climbing down from my executive chair of control. I must uncreate the world I have so carefully fashioned to further my ends and advance my cause. So the first step in prayer is to acknowledge or to remember that God is God. He is in control and his authority cannot be usurped. A prayer, prayer is our highest privilege. It's our greatest responsibility and the greatest power that God has put into our hands. Prayer, real prayer, is the noblest, the sublimest, the most the stupendous act that any creature of God can perform. Prayer is the very highest energy of which human nature is capable. To pray with all of your heart and your strength, that is the last and greatest achievement of the Christian's warfare on earth. The great lesson to be gained from Jesus' prayer life is his complete surrender, his submission, and his obedience to his Father's will. The conclusive manifestation of this is seen in the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was always his Father's will. If it, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken from me, except I drink it, may your will be done, Jesus prayed. He taught us many things about prayer, gave us a model prayer. And in its strictest sense, the Lord's prayer is really the disciples' prayer. And in the briefest sense, he gives us a comprehensive course in the theology of prayer. He enunciates eight, eight principles. Adoration, thanksgiving, affirmation, Forgiveness, renewal, personal needs, others' needs, how to bring our prayers to a close. If this is the prayer we are to go by, then we should examine ourselves in its light. The only acceptable prayer is that prayer which is offered in the spirit and manner of the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. I read a selection entitled, Can You Say the Lord's Prayer? You see, I cannot say R if I live in a watertight spiritual compartment. I cannot say Father if I do not demonstrate 
that relationship in daily life. I cannot say thy kingdom come if I am not doing what I can to hasten its coming. I cannot say thy will be done if I am questioning, resentful, or disobedient to his will for me. I cannot say on earth as it is in heaven if I am not prepared to devote my life to his service. I cannot say give us this day our daily bread if I live on past experience. I cannot say forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us if I harbor a grudge. I cannot say lead us not into temptation if I deliberately place myself in a position to be tempted. And I cannot say deliver us from evil if I am not prepared to fight evil with the weapon of prayer. I cannot say thine, thine is the kingdom if I do not give the king the discipline, obedience of a loyal subject. I cannot say thine is the power if I fear what people may say or do to me. I cannot say thine is the glory if I am seeking glory for myself. And I cannot say forever and ever if my horizon is bounded by the things of time and of this world. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to rest in you. Teach us to do what Daniel and his friends did when they were faced with this insurmountable problem or challenge. Even the threat of death. They prayed and then they rested knowing that God answers prayer and that with him all things are possible. What do you say? Amen. Who will join me in saying, Lord, teach us to really pray. Teach us how to rest in faith after we have prayed. Teach us how to rest, to pray and to rest even before the answer to our prayers are realized. See, the chapter two of Daniel teaches us many things. It teaches us about the kingdom, the coming kingdom of God, but it also teaches us that the greatest preparation that we can make is learning how to rest in by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you say? If it's your desire, beloved, to say, Lord, teach us how to truly pray. That's our path to glory. We will get from here to the kingdom of God by learning how to learn, learning how to rest in the Lord and believing with all of our hearts that the God that we talk to in prayer is the God that will save us in his kingdom. The God who will resolve any challenge that life presents us with the God who when we pray hears answers those prayers and strengthens us and makes us ready to meet him in peace if you want to have that kind of prayer life I want you to stand to your feet with me Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for being the patient God that you are, the loving and gracious God that you are. We think sometimes, Lord, that we are great prayers whether it's by the words that we use or when we have great need, we come and we say we pray. But Lord, we want that type of prayer life that when we speak to you in prayer, 
if we'll learn how to rest and really indeed leave it to you to learn how to really be still and know that you are God that there's nothing literally in this world that we can handle without you at every moment of time in our homes in the church in our workplaces when challenges arise help us Lord to look to you before even uttering a word help us to utter the first word to you and not to others we utter that word Lord because we need your wisdom we need your power we need your strength to be like Daniel and his companions Lord to pray and then take a rest knowing that it is safe in your hands and anything that we bring to you you will handle it because uh, you are a loving God you love us and you desire only our best thank you Lord for your sacrifice thank you for loving us thank you for saving us may each of us be prepared to meet you in peace when you come the Lord before we close this this service today we want to extend to some man woman boy or girl in this audience the invitation to give yourself to Jesus maybe you are not a member of this fellowship of believers but God has so impressed your heart today that you want to make a stand for Jesus today you want to say Lord I am yours I have resisted long enough and today I want to declare by the uplifting of my hand that I want to be a part of this fellowship of believers who keep all the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ I want to be a part of your family and I want to publicly de declare it today by the lifting of my hand wherever you are right now we extend that invitation to you God's calling you every opportunity that and every opportunity that we have to have to come into his presence is an opportunity to surrender ourselves completely to him he loves you wants to save you wants you to draw close to him the door of invitation remains open but there may be somebody else here that before we close this prayer today that you're struggling with something and you've been guilty of not releasing it totally to the Lord oh yes you may have called on his name but you're still holding on to that thing and you need to be able to say Lord I release it in Jesus name today and you need that that power coming from God to be able to release and give it to him completely if that's you lift your hand in the air so that we might include you in this prayer God sees those hands God sees those hands and he knows the circumstance and he will answer thank you father thank you in the name for Jesus Christ who makes our our worship our praise our prayer and our praise possible You've seen the hands Lord and you know the circumstance hear their prayers help each of us Lord to each one to surrender themselves completely to you and take their rest in the Lord Jesus Christ for we've asked these blessings and this prayer in the name in that worthy name let all of God's people say amen God bless you you may be seated